So anyway, guys, we're welcome to the uh, People's uh, Parliament. Uh, we're here for the war machine. Oh yes, and uh, we have uh, one of the uh, people who are going to be speaking later on. Oh, see, see. So you're supposed to be there. Okay. So anyway, guys, this is the People's Parliament. We're in the Houses of Parliament, so hopefully you will us be there then. So that way. So we'll see how many people actually uh, can get there. Some of the people that I've interviewed, 
and um, I've got six people here. There's three more people uh, possibly going to make it on the way. Uh, um, I'm going to go and sit down now. Okay, well, thanks very much indeed, Mark, and uh, it's great to be able to, to meet Mark, having seen him on uh, Twitter and YouTube on numerous occasions. It's really good to be able to meet him in the flesh for the first time. Now, I've been asked to chair this session of the People's Parliament. People's Parliament, as people probably know, is the idea of uh, John McDonald MP, another Labour MP, who was keen to try and enliven sort of the political discourse in the run up to the elections and try and influence ideas going in. To that election, there's been quite a number of uh, these sessions uh, on uh, different occasions. This is one of a series I chaired one uh, a couple of weeks ago now on a progressive foreign policy. Sadly, there wasn't quite as many people uh, at that meeting as there was today. But the idea is that the ideas which are articulated, the discussion that we have in these meetings, will be collated and will be brought together in a final uh, document that will go up to hopefully uh, you know, influence the uh, policy uh, considerations mm -hmm. in the run-up to that election. Mm -hmm. So it's good to, to be here. In fact, I don't want to speak for too long because we've got a lot of speakers. And we're going to, I've been told, to limit each speaker to five minutes. So I've got a stopwatch here on my uh, on the phone here. So I'm going to give an opportunity for contributions from the floor. It's important that people do try as far as they can to stick to five minutes. What I'm going to do is say, start my stopwatch. When we get to four minutes, I'll give the speaker, if they're still speaking, a one minute uh, warning, uh, and then uh, try and persuade him to bring their remarks to a close in the next 60 seconds. Now, the first speaker we've got is Andy from uh, DPAC, and uh, Andy's got to leave, unfortunately, so he's going to go first. Uh, last weekend, people will probably be aware, DPAC uh, protested at Westminster and try to claim sanctuary at Westminster Abbey, but again, as people will have probably seen on the news, the dean called the police, and they were, uh, uh, even though they were protesting against the government scrapping of the independent uh, living fund, which I think is a vital life. Man, as a former welfare rights officer, I know, uh, certainly when I was uh, working in that role, how important uh, the independent living fund actually uh, was. But in spite of, uh, I think, a very valid uh, protest that the uh, uh, activists uh, were in, in, engaged in, uh, the police report by the Dean, and uh, I'm sure everybody saw what happened on the uh, TV news. So without further ado, I will invite Andy to uh, address the uh, meeting now. I'm starting my clock. Where is Andy? Okay. Um, thank you for the invitation as well um, to speak. Um, I think probably one of the things that I read most on social media, you know, um, hear most when you're out and about in the streets is, does this government not realise the impact that uh, its austerity programme is having on disabled people? And I think that's quite naive really, because I think this government quite clearly realises um, the impact that the austerity programme is having on disabled people. But it's simply disinterested, um, because actually, to them, the end, the, uh, the end is just by the means. And when your end is to move as much public money uh, out of the public realm and into private pockets as quickly as possible, then I think that actually you're quite prepared to trample over anybody as a means to achieving that. And it just so happens that the same people are, um, by the nature of impairment, um, big users of public services, big contributors and big users to public services. Um, and as a disabled person, when you are a user of health services and when you're a user of education and social care and voluntary sector services and even work support services and housing and all these things that you interact with more by the nature of impairment over the course of your life, then when the cuts come in a manner and when policy changes come in the manner in which they do, um, it's absolutely massive because what we're not seeing happening is any of these bills coming down. What we're simply seeing happening is the public responsibility and accountability for these services has been whittled away and eroded. And what we're seeing is that actually private health care, private education, private care homes for social care, um, private companies like A4E, Capita, Atos, all absolutely um, ravenous around public services. 
and gorging themselves on public money at the expense of those who have contributed to it and who are service users at the end of the day. And when it comes in this kind of manner, there has to be a reaction. When every single public service and every single support service has been whittled away, there has to be a reaction. And disabled people throughout, you know, throughout our own history have reacted readily um, every time. And it's always been based around what we can do, based around how hard we can hit, how we can mobilise a collective, and how we can create really vibrant spaces where disabled people can come in and say exactly what the situation is and bring our end of the argument out into that public space and actually provide some sort of balance and some sort of opportunity. And this time around, DPAC and the disability movement has been making the best use of these new platforms, social media, online, um, all the things that we associate now with new 21st century activism. But also we've been quite willing to be risky. We were quite willing to go out on the streets and to occupy government departments and to go to government ministers' homes when very few people were prepared to go out and do that. We've also been quite prepared to act in solidarity with all sorts of groups, the Occupy Movement, UK and Cup, Reclaim the Power, Youth Poverty Action, the Student Movement, the Pensioners Movement, all sorts of different activist groups out there on the ground that DPAC has been willing to work with alongside and you know, um, show the kind of in, in, ingenuity and support which has become really critical as, as we progress. And I think making sure that everything is around being inclusive. And I think that's one of the key things that, as Chris spoke about what happened over the weekend. What many have they? Yeah, the ILF is a kind of, is a support fund for people with high support needs. And we're having the conversations around it without the context of what's happening in social care to local authorities, which have been absolutely decimated. The biggest cost to local councils is social care. And over the course of this parliament and over the course of this decade, we're looking at losing over between 33% and 50% of social care, and that's an issue that affects us all. And the ILF is going to force people into social care homes if it closes. And that's going to be pretty damning as a society that if we are prepared to roll back um, inclusiveness and roll back the kind of progressive ideas that we've had and worked so hard as a community and as a society to, um, to embrace. And we're quite prepared to do that and sacrifice disabled people on the altar of profit for the corporations. And I think it's time as a society that we took a stand together and said enough is enough. Spot on, mate. Two seconds. Uh, in, in time. Andy, what time have you got to go? I, I can hold on under five or ten minutes. Okay, mate. Right. I just thought rather than, because what I was planning to do was invite all the speakers to address the meeting and then have a sort of interactive conversation thereafter. Given that Andy's got to go, I think he's made a really important contribution, uh, uh, particularly around this notion about you know, developing a sort of progressive coalition, if we put it like that, something I'm very passionate about and it's really vital, I think, that we that we do do that. I just wonder if there's any comments that people want to make now so that Andy has an opportunity, if he wants to, to respond. Anybody want to uh, change it or, yeah? uh, You did mention the, what's happening on Friday. Yeah, so on Friday, um, DPAC has the independent, we've rebranded Independence Day as Independent Living Day. We are holding an independent living tea party across the road from here at Caxton House at the Department for uh, uh, Work and Pensions. And again, it's about saying what we're for, not just what we're against. You know, independent living has been one of the cornerstones of our movement for the last 50 years. And it's, a, you know, it's not about being an island, it's about actually uh, society providing the kind of support that everybody needs to live independently and to have choice and options about the way that we live. And it's about not recognizing you know, uh, a kind of deficit support of care, but actually an aspirational support of care. Not what are the things that you need, but what, the, what are the things that you want to do with your life? What do you aspire to? What is the kind of life that you want to live? And that's what independent living means. And I think now more than any, at any point, certainly over the last couple of decades, that's under threat. And I think what we need to do is have a reaction to that as, this, you know, as, as disabled people, but very much as um, our society as well, and, and right across the whole community, because every one of us needs support in different ways, and to be able to make those kinds of choices, and we all have a collective responsibility to each other to make sure that we can all benefit from and contribute to society on our own terms. Any other, any other contributions anybody wants to make before Andy has to leave? Yes, sir. 
you know, we took for granted perhaps for, for, for far too uh, long. And, uh, you know, you talked about politics in the academic sense, but, you know, you're talking about politics in the very kind of real from end sense, you know, yeah. these, these are political decisions that, you know, affecting uh, your life and, 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 you know, millions of other people in, in different contexts. Because so we right. need to sort of stand together and, you know, say we're not going to accept this. And the idea is one thing, but a practical <laughs> use of something like violet is another thing. And I think people, that's just not in the uh, public domain. And I think people are looking at the same people and thinking that they're getting something for free. I think that's part of it too. And that's why I think it goes back to this kind of you know building a progressive coalition, if you like, to yeah. kind of you know stand up for things which uh, which are important, which kind of define a decent society. But I think we probably better move on because we're gonna run out of time, we've got to be out of here by uh, about half past eight. So our next speaker, I want to thank Andrew.